I am I came from the country of Indonesia I was here before uh, five years ago so I wouldn't reintroduce myself you know we're all friends now and we are God's people but this morning I would like to share with you what the church should look like you know love look like something when you see somebody who is hungry the love that is in your heart will propel you to do something about it because love always look like something the Bible told us in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus looked at the multitude and he has compassion for them and that compassion looks like something he said to the disciples you give them something to eat well a little boy eight years old like the young fellow over here came and contributed the little that he has you see if all you need and all we need is, our, is to meet our needs, then we don't need a miracle. Because you see, the little boy has five loaves of bread. And that's enough for his lunch or for dinner at that time. But the reason the miracle took place is because there's the multitude. There are others that were hungry. And so the young fellow gave the five little loaves there. And guess what happened? 20 plus thousand people were fed, 5,000 men, 5,000 ladies, their wives, uh, th three kids each, you know. Well, if they come from Palestine, it's not going to be three. I'm not pointing any direction here. But, you know, with three kids each, you're talking about 15,000. And praise God, 20 plus thousand people, they need the food. And for others to be fed and satisfied, we have to give the little that we have so that Jesus can multiply it. And I'm here, church, to let you know that the miracle of multiplication that took place 2,000 years ago is still taking place today. Because of the multitude, the miracle of multiplication will take place because of the multitude. It's because of others who are not sitting here this morning, but they're out there. For their sake, for the millions in the world, for the seven billions that are alive in this planet today, ladies and gentlemen, the miracle of multiplication will take place. And all we need to contribute is not what we didn't have. All we need to contribute is what we have in our hand. You know, God is fair. He wouldn't ask you to contribute something that is not there. That's a little unfair. He just said, what you got in your hand, you know. Little, no problem. I created the universe. I hang the stars in the sky. I created the oceans and the mountains. Just give me what you have. Reason being, not that he couldn't do it without the little fella. He just want to partner with us. That is the essence of the church. The book of Acts chapter 2 told us how the church began. It began because when they gathered together like this, the Holy Ghost came down. And the Holy Ghost came down because as pastor just told us here, Jesus, who the Father sent, went back to heaven. And so he sent the Holy Ghost in his place. But it was Jesus that sent the Holy Ghost. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, the Father's gift to the sinners, you and I, was the Son, Jesus Christ. The son's gift to the saints, praise God, you and I, the church, is the person of the Holy Spirit. So when we receive the gift of the Father while we are sinners, that is the person of Jesus Christ. Then, ladies and gentlemen, he, the Savior, will gift us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, so that we can do what he has done, even greater than that, because we are the New Testament church. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the church. And the reason I'm excited about the church is because this morning in the New Testament church in Rome, New York, sitting here in the presence of God more than was there 2,000 years ago in a mount called Galilee. In Matthew chapter 28, the Bible said, he told the disciples to meet him in a place that he has designated. May I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that today, this morning, you are in the place that he has designated. Here in his presence. Why he asked them to come to the place he has designated? Because he has something important to tell him, to tell them. 
And he said to them, all the power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. So go unto all the world and preach the gospel. Let us go to Matthew chapter 28, please, if you don't mind. I'll read it for you. This is what the writer of the book of Matthew said. All right, Matthew chapter 28. I just have to move over there because I happen to put it on the book of Acts here. But I'm moving closer there and I am there. Matthew chapter 28. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Oh, I can see all of you worshiping Jesus today. So if you were there 2,000 years ago, you will be in the group of the worshipers. Bless God. But you know, the Bible said some worship, some were doubtful. Now I wonder who was in that group, or at least let us call, who was the chief doubter? Somebody help me here, please. Well, his name is Thomas, poor guy. You know, he has been designated to be the doubting Thomas. And so he got the name stick on him or stuck on him. And so you and I know who the Bible was talking about when we talk about doubting Thomas, the doubters. I always wonder when I read this Bible first here the other day, hmm, what's the matter with Thomas? Why did he doubt? He didn't believe what others told him when Jesus was there. Or maybe he believed them, but he couldn't quite figure it out how that can happen. How can the one who is life and life everlasting die? Or how can after he died, he rose back from the dead? Thomas was thinking, yeah, uh, he rose back from the dead. He rose Lazarus from the dead. But he, ro he raised Lazarus from the dead. Who Raise him from the dead. The father? You know, Thomas graduating from uh, New York, Utica uh, University. You know, the one down the road here. He's a smart guy. You know, he's just like the Americans of our day. He just wants to figure things out. And if he couldn't quite wrap his mind around it, he has a little question. Doubting in a sense of trying to figure out what is going on. And one would wonder how far a doubting Thomas in the church of then and today will go. If I'm Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say to the group of worshipers, you just graduated here. Go for it. You know, uh, Pastor Majid and Sister Beverly has taught you guys right. You guys have been listening to the word of the Lord. You are ready to just twist the devil's horn off and bring in the millions unto the kingdom. You qualify for the mission that I'm about to tell you. But for the group over here, or maybe they're on the left, the doubting ones, I tell you what, maybe you should go to higher ground here, you know, where uh, Pastor Masset and Pastor Majid has been teaching these people here. Give yourself another three years to graduate, and then probably we can talk about doing something for the kingdom of God and be the church that I have designated you to be. But, you know, it didn't happen that way. I'm glad and you should be happy that I'm not Jesus. Because if I am, I'm judging things a little differently and I'll mess up somebody's call and somebody's future. But Jesus was very interesting. The worshipers were there and Sister Beverly led the group and the doubters were there over in the other side. Somehow, he overlooked who they were and what they have done and he said to them, I am the great I am. All the power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. In another word, ladies and gentlemen, he focused them into himself. He's Alpha and Omega. He is the one who has been sent by the Father. Oh, he's the bright and morning stars. He's the savior. He's the creator of the universe. You can name him. And he got all the names from Genesis to Revelation. He is the mighty one. Oh, he's life and life everlasting. He's resurrection and life. He is the healer. He is the almighty God. <laughs> I'm going to use my next half an hour just to mention all those names. So I wouldn't do it. Because, well, one of the best reasons is that you know who he is. He focused them on himself. And then he gave them something I wouldn't do 
the most impossible task there is. And that is to go unto all the world to preach the gospel. Now you give that task to the worshipers. There's a chance they can accomplish it. You give the task to the doubters. Good luck. <laughs> but you see ladies and gentlemen. The most amazing part about this story. When we take the focus of who we are. And focus on who he is. Then all of a sudden he changed the whole equation. Because ladies and gentlemen. I will just help you out a little bit here. Not that you don't know it. History has established. That from the 11 that were there. The group of worshippers. And the doubters. Boy Thomas managed to <coughs> recruit a few of them. You know <coughs> on his corner. Because the Bible doesn't say some worship and some, uh, uh, some worship and only one doubted. It said some worship, some doubted. So let's just split it down the middle, kind of. Six worship, five doubted. But never mind, we don't have to find out who doubted. Let's just blame it on Thomas here for a minute. <coughs> because he's the chief troublemaker. After they all focus on Jesus... And then Jesus told them something. We'll read this in the book of Acts. That's why I put it on the book of Acts here. Before I have to go back and find Matthew here. Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem. Because the Holy Ghost that I promise will be sent, will be given unto you. <clears throat> and when you receive the Holy Ghost, ladies and gentlemen, you shall receive power. Oh, that is the kind of Bible first that we in the charismatic movement like. I walk into the front today and said, this is a New Testament church, charismatic and non-denominational. I said, that is great. I open the door and walk in saying, this is the place to be here this morning. You are the church, the New Testament church. You are the one that Jesus established. You are partners for his purpose in this generation. But let us go back to that generation. So they all went everywhere according to history. Uh, one of them went down to Ethiopia, Africa, somewhere there. James hang around Jerusalem and the area there. Uh, somebody have to watch the headquarters, you know. <clears throat> and uh, one of them went over to Persia. And uh, that some of them went up to Turkey of today, the uh, Asia Minor. And they, they, they spread out everywhere. They went everywhere. But ladies and gentlemen, do you know? That the doubter, the chief doubter, Thomas, went the furthest. Ethiopia was quite a distance. Persia was also quite a distance. But India was the farthest one can go in that generation. And doubting Thomas all the way from Jerusalem went all the way to India, which is the furthest you can go without the um, tools or without the existence of Air India or, you know, Air Marriage or um, American Airline and uh, British Airways. You know, we in this generation, the church of today, we got a little advantage. I'll talk about it here in a minute. The possibility that we have is tremendous. But in order to encourage us to see where we can be, let's go back to them guys at that time that didn't have as much in a sense that we have. At least they didn't have the tool of today. To go all the way from Jerusalem to India, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it take you forever to get there. I wonder if he has to sail to a certain point and take a camel to another point and walk through the desert and the mountains and the rivers and, you know, who knows he has to go in order to uh, get to India. But to India, he did. And not only he got to India, ladies and gentlemen, I just came back from India the other day, graduating some of our students in Nagaland. And I told our students, I said, don't go to Africa. We'll take care of Africa. Don't go to Latin America. We'll take care of Latin America. Some will take care of that. But you guys, you are in the middle of India, the people from Nagaland. Within two hour flight radius from Nagaland, you have the Chinese, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Bangladeshis. About half or over half of the world population live next door to you. 
So I, just, I said, don't waste your money to come to Europe. Somebody will take care of Europe. Stay where you are because half of the world population that need to hear the gospel is next door to you. You know, you can just take the bus and go there or walk if you have to. But the greatest and the majority of population living here next door, which means, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest harvest that we're going to see in this generation besides other places will be that region where Thomas came 1900 years ago. So I told uh, our Bible school student from Nagaland, I said to them, you know what? You stay here and reach the billions in this region here so that you can finish what Thomas has started 19 years ago. 1900 years ago, I'm sorry, 1900 years ago or 19 centuries ago, that's what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, when I'm talking about a church, I'm excited. When I walk into this building today, I said, oh Lord, there's something is going to happen in this generation. And the folks that are going to be here this morning are the partners that you have chosen to make a difference in the nations in this generation. And the reason I said so, ladies and gentlemen, is because of Thomas, the knucklehead doubter. You know what I'm trying? I'm not trying to put him down. I'm just trying to help you to relate with him. You know what I mean? Because sometimes we say, oh, I haven't gone to the Bible school yet, or the theological cemetery in Dallas, I mean seminary, or you, you, you know what I mean. I'm just a housewife. I'm just living in a little town by the, uh, by the name Rome. I'm not even in Rome. Rome was a little one in New York. I'm over in the other side of Rome. You know what I mean? Just a few trees around the house, you know. I'm not this, I'm not that. But I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to tell you that if the knucklehead doubter Thomas can go all the way from Jerusalem to India then ladies and gentlemen there is no excuse for anyone and the church of this generation not to rise and fulfill her destiny and I dare say so ladies and gentlemen because as pastor said I was 19 years old you just miss it by one pastor, but 18 and 19, you can't tell the difference anyway. And so I was 19 years old when I embraced Jesus. And I was filled with the Holy Ghost a few weeks later. And then when the Holy Ghost came down like a mighty wind and like fire, it has propelled us. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I've walked with Jesus for 52 years and I'm grateful for each one of those days. Because you know what? When Jesus came into my heart, for years when I was in high school, I was looking for healing because I got malaria during my high school years. Looking for healing but never found it. But the day I found Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, it was an exciting day because that day when I accepted Jesus, I knew that I knew that my sins were forgiven. You need to be forgiven, ladies and gentlemen. That is a big thing. You know why? Because we all have blown it. I mean, maybe some of you here haven't yet. Don't lie to me, please, okay? Or don't make me, you know, uh, get on you here. My Bible told me that all has been sinned. All have, have sinned, you know, and we all are heading the wrong direction and death will be our portion. Oh, but my Bible also said, <clears throat> for the disobedience of one, all of us has been condemned to death. But because of the obedience of one. Jesus. All of us has been made righteous. We are the children of the living God. Ladies and gentlemen. And when I found Jesus. I was grateful that my sins were forgiven. Heaven will be my home. Heaven will be my home. Thank you Jesus. You might see me once every five years. But let me tell you something. I'll miss you maybe when I come this way. But when you got to heaven, yours truly will be right there in the other side of the polar gate waiting to welcome you when you got there. You ain't going to miss me there. You're going to take yourself a little time to find everybody. But we have eternity to discover each other and to just tell some stories of the goodness of God. Because heaven is my home and will be the far God is my father and I have received, received eternal life. You too can rejoice for that fact. That day I was so happy when I found Jesus knowing this. I said I can't just keep this to myself. Statistics say there's about 100,000 people died every day in this world. 
And most of them, over half, did not know Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, church, let us be serious here. If that many people died every day in the world without knowing Jesus and will go to hell, I submit that we, the church, should do a little better. I'm not talking about this church here. I'm talking about, the, you know, we pass a church when we have up here on 49, you know. And uh, I'm telling you, you know, that church need to really wake up and get things together. Because ladies and gentlemen, we can't go to heaven and allow others to go to hell. Because that gift that has been given to us must be shared by those. Is uh, Jesus calling or somebody's phone? Never mind. So ladies and gentlemen, I was so excited when I found Jesus that I told everybody that I can from that day on. I forgot to ask for my healing. But a month later, I realized, hey, I'm feeling better. Three months later, I said, really, I'm feeling good. A year later, I said, Praise you, Jesus. I think the miracle has taken place. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to declare to you for the glory of God. 52 years later, December the 3rd, 2017, I have been walking healthy for 52 years. No malaria, no sickness, no nothing. Stronger and healthier today than when I was 19. And the reason being, when I looked for healing, I didn't find it. But when I found Jesus, I found the healer. And when you find the healer, ladies and gentlemen, healing comes with the healer. Jesus. He was the reason the church is here. The disciples met him. The disciples focus on him. And when you focus on Jesus, oh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll go far. Ask Dr. Thomas. He went all the way to India without the benefit of all the tools and the modern transportation that we have. And I dare say this morning, if without the tools that you and I have, man, we got the phone. In those days, if, uh, what's his name, Thomas, want to report back to James in Jerusalem as to what happened in the ministry, forget it. You know, you're going to send somebody in a camel to go back with a little, you know, paper writing down your testimony as what happened when you were halfway uh, after you cross um, uh, Iraq on your way over to Afghanistan or, you know, somewhere there on the, your, way the, your way down to India. Thank you forever to do it. The tools that we have today was not necessary. I was not there. We didn't have the iPhone where you can pick it up in five seconds. You can talk with anybody else that you have. To, you, have. you know, in those days, and uh, I heard somebody uh, kind of think that, say the other day I was with Pastor Massat in higher ground, and somebody said, man, we're going to go to India. India and it's going to take us 23-hour flight. And that was about right. And she wasn't complaining, but she just said, that's going to be a long haul. And I agree. I've taken 17, 20 plus hours flight going to Africa, Mozambique, and different places. So I, I know the person was right. And then Pastor Massa piped up and said, I wonder what Thomas will say. <laughs> Thomas will say, you mean you got there and you're going to die in 23 hours sitting in comfort? <laughs> Listening or looking to the video, movie, whatever in front of you. With the music, praise music in your ears. I'm giving you the praise music because I'm not sure. You know, you, you know what I mean? We're not here to kind of bang on nobody. We gave everybody credit, you know. So you're having um, the hill song uh, music on your ears. And the girls passing by, can I give you a water? You want water, coffee, tea, uh, apple juice, uh, you know, this meal, that meal. You want chicken parmesan or, uh, you know, the steak, uh, whatever that thing is. My goodness. Thomas will say, guys, you're complaining or wondering that's going to take you 23 hours flying in comfort to get to India. He said, come back on my time. And then you'll know, you know, what it is to complain about. Oh, but Thomas went that the farthest. And ladies and gentlemen, if Thomas went the farthest, 
in the conditions that he was. They only have about 100, 200 million people alive at that time. They got half of them saved. That's great, 100 million. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that ain't nothing to compare with the potential and the possibility that the New Testament church in Rome have today. Why? Because we have 7 billion people living in the world today by the power of the same Holy Ghost and in the name of the mighty Jesus that we focus on and we love. I reckon, ladies and gentlemen, we can be excited about the potential of the billions that come to know Jesus in our generation. Because the same Holy Spirit that was given to Thomas is the same Holy Spirit that was given to us. And Jesus said, when you receive this Holy Ghost, power will come upon you. Power what? Not the power to heal. It comes later. Not the power to get the goosebumps. Ah. Goosebumps are okay from time to time. But instead of goosebumps, I'd rather get the goth bump or something like that. You know, ladies and gentlemen, instead of a little manifestations, I like the total transformation and the release of the power of God to make the difference in the life of the lost for the glory of God. Not against, you know, any manifestation. Jump up and down, holler, roll down the aisle here. If pastor don't mind, I don't mind. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit is to allow the church to become a witness from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the uttermost part of the world. So, I guess I did it right when I was 19. I forget to ask for healing. I got excited and I went out everywhere sharing Jesus with my friends, walking the first year all over the island, the second year take a boat to the next one, and it has been 52 years, and ladies and gentlemen, it has been glorious. Because the presence of the Holy Spirit revealed the love and the power of Jesus like he did it in the Bible. So let me just kind of give you a little rundown as to what has happened these last 52 years. And the last five years since I saw you. But this last 52 years, we have seen millions of Muslims come to know Jesus. Pastor Majid will appreciate that coming from the background that he came. You know how hard it is to reach them folk for Jesus. But I'm here, Brother Majid, to tell you because of your faithfulness and your prayer for the work of God in the Middle East. We are the generation. Sister Beverly, you better... Got ready here. You might not see the grandbabies as often as you can. But let me tell you something. We are the generation that will see literally the greatest number of Muslims came to embrace Jesus in this generation. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You know why? Because there's a promise that was given to Israel. Thank you for watching this edition of Glory to Glory. If you would like to support our ministry, please text NTC Gives to 77977. And please join us each week for Sunday school at 9 and service at 1030. From the New Testament Church and Pastor Majid Saloom, may the power and blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.